Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Indira Orozco. Um, uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm the managing director of Sending in Color. We are so excited to have everyone here today. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the mission of Sending in Color, we strive to create a diverse and inclusive climbing community and industry by implementing justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion principles to break down barriers of accessibility for all Black, Indigenous, and people of color. We also work to create educational spaces to introduce new climbers to the sport and the outdoors. We are very excited to have you all here for Trevor's film screening debut. Trevor has been a part of the Sending in Color team for quite some time, so we are super excited. I've been friends with Trevor since I first started climbing five years ago, so this is an extra momentous uh, moment for me to be a part of this. Super proud of you, Trevor, and so um, we will talk more with Trevor and the star of the film, Taylor, after the screening. Um, but if you are able to support and haven't already donated, you can donate via Cash App to dollar sign Riley, R-I-L-E-Y, P-K. And the proceeds go to Trevor, Taylor, Sending in Color, as well as Own Your Own Media. Um, and for now, I will pass it over to my co-host, Wanjiro. Thanks, Indira. Um, I am Wanjiro as Wanjiro Pinocchio. Uh, my pronouns are she, they, and I am the director of events at Sending in Color. Um, and I'm so excited to be part of this release of Trevor Riley's latest masterpiece, Grit. Uh, a quick shout out and a huge thank you to Own Your Media. Everyone, please take a moment, like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, they've got big things, keep an eye out. Also, a big thank you to Brooklyn Boulders and Gnarly for sponsoring the film. And thank you to all of you for coming. So uh, with that, enjoy a short word from our sponsor, Gnarly, and enjoy Grit. Oh. <laughs> I'm Taylor Jefferson. I'm a rock climber and neuroscience PhD candidate at Northwestern University here in Chicago. I've been climbing for four years. Started back in college where the gym had a 55 foot climbing wall and it was on everyone's bucket list to at least get to the top before you graduated. And once I did, I was hooked. So when I came here for grad school, it was really important for me to find a community and a gym where I felt I was surrounded by other people who are as stoked on the sport as I was. I got into neuroscience because I was really interested in human behavior and I just fell in love with the study of it because for some areas of it, it's literally understanding how these neurons, these electrically firing neurons are interacting with each other to produce that human behavior or that movement or that pain that you're feeling. It's an amazing field in that it incorporates a wide variety of approaches to understand the relationship between the brain and the rest of the body. I'm studying the neurobiology of chronic pain and assessing how acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter or a chemical transmitted between neurons, affects the modulation of pain either sensory or cognitively. In addition to assessing acetylcholine's modulation on chronic pain, I'm looking at differences between males and females and how acetylcholine is affected. 
So day to day, I'm assessing acetylcholine's modulation on these neurons by recording their firing activity. And I do that by putting in brain slices from my samples and recording them in artificial cerebral spinal fluid so that they stay alive and are firing as naturally as possible. In addition, I'm also looking at fragments of protein and counting that protein between males and females and trying to see if there's a difference in expression. I mean, it's similar to being a scientist in a lot of respects. Both need perseverance, consistency, internal motivation, and both need excitement to want to do what you're doing. You're not always gonna see the rewards of your training immediately. It's always gonna be months or even a season later. I'm always needing to be aware of what my weaknesses are in terms of strength or body movement when I'm gonna try to project a route because I want to go into it knowing where I need to work so that I can get the results that I want. I grew up as a competitive swimmer, both for a USA swim team and for the high school swim team. So I naturally had a strong upper body and I think I just had strong fingers from having to pull myself through the water um, and not realizing that tendon strength also correlated to good tendon strength in terms of climbing. And I think I understood just kind of the mental strength you need to have to push yourself. The consistency that you need, that internal motivation, that excitement that you need to keep going, and knowing that you will see your rewards in the end is something I've realized I've taken away from my scientific life. So before I get on a hard project of mine, a lot's going on in my head. I'm hyping myself up, telling myself, you know, I can do this and preparing to give it my all. I'm also really excited to get on and see how I'm gonna perform, how I'm gonna move through the sequence that I have identified as the crux from the ground. And I'm also just really eager to get into that, like, flow state that I enjoy with climbing. It's not until I'm on the wall and I put my hands on that start hold that I'm like completely checked out. Everything kind of just like falls away and I can enter this flow state that really kind of attracts me to climbing now. I don't really like the word or the idea of considering it a failure if I didn't complete a route or clean, I guess. I just kind of take it as like, I've reached my limit and now I need to figure out how to pass that limit. I do it kind of the same way I would analyze like a experiment in the lab that didn't go well. I'm just like, okay, what went wrong here? What needs to be focused on to make a change? More of a, a fun puzzle for me to be like, okay, what is the movement? What's the beta here? What did I do wrong in the initial beta? And then when I can go away and train on that and come back and then complete the route, it's, you know, exciting. My motivation comes from just really chasing that high that I get from finishing a route, or not even finishing a route, just getting to the top. Like, even if I fell and I had to figure out the beta a couple times, when I make it to the top, I'm just like, yes, that was amazing. I want to do it again. Right now, I joke a lot with friends saying that I'm a gym rat who doesn't want to be a gym rat anymore. My current goal with climbing is to just get outdoors more. I have a couple projects outside, but I just haven't had the time to 
actually get out there and get on them as consistently as I want. So right now I'm just trying to take the time, take those long weekends to get outside and get on them more. Thank you everyone for watching Grit and welcome to the interview portion for our evening. Uh, Indira, Indira and I are joined by our filmmaker Trevor and our star Taylor. Um, we will be opening up the chat for audience questions for the last 10 minutes. So go ahead and start thinking, dropping them in and please be sure to specify whether your questions are for Trevor, Taylor or both. Um, and with that, uh, we have, we're gonna be starting with Taylor. Um, Taylor, this was amazing to watch you climb and see your transition of life between being a neuroscientist and being a climber. Uh, but in the video, you're so confident and focused on the climb. What, what, what were you climbing? Tell us more about that. Um, in the video, I was climbing uh, 12 minus, uh, but it was really a climb that was a variety of different movements that were challenging for me. And I think that's what drew me to uh, the problem because there were a lot of reachy sequences and there are a lot of like hardcore body movements, especially at the end that I was just like mentally had to push through as well as physically, which I think what drew me uh, to it for a challenge. And it was set by one of my favorite outsiders at the gym and always delivers with challenging sequences. <laughs> uh, you looked so confident uh, when you were climbing it. <laughs> but in the film, you also talked about how you got into climbing. And I, I just have to ask because 
I have to ask, but what year did you get to the top of the climbing wall in college? Uh, my spring semester of senior year. So that last maybe February before graduation. And once I did, like I said, I was hooked and probably went back to the gym like every week with whoever, one of my friends who was willing to go. <laughs> I mean, that's what happens to us all. Uh, you also train so diligently in the film. Uh, tell us more about what your training regimen looks like. Um, I think overall, I kind of go through cycles throughout the year, whether I'm going to focus on pool exercises or uh, campusing and hangboarding. Uh, right now, I'm kind of in a pool sequence, so I'm doing like two a days of pool exercises uh, body weight and then weighted and then I do uh, once a week leg day and then another antagonist um, body mobility kind of day and I try not to climb more than three days a week because otherwise I would climb every day if I could. Uh, that between the training and climbing I don't know how you go on but between <laughs> training and research how do you stay motivated? Um I think before, like when I initially decided I'm going to start training outside or away from the wall is more that I had big goals for myself on uh, trying to keep pushing that limit and climbing. And initially it was just kind of like, oh, I really kind of want to achieve this goal. Let me do what I can do off the wall. And I think now it's just become like a habit or a really defined self-discipline to just get up every morning because if I was motivated or waited to be motivated to get up at 5 a.m., then I would probably only train like once a month. Did you say you train at 5 a.m.? Yeah, that's what I did in swimming, and it just kind of stuck with me. <laughs> that's, that's impressive. Uh, <laughs> you touched on this a little bit in your last explanation, and you did touch on this in the movie, in the film, but uh, you call yourself a gym rat that doesn't want to be. So have you been outside since the making of the film? I have actually this last um, season, I guess people call it in climbing. I got outdoors maybe four or five times. Often with Trevor, we went to a local crag called, or uh, in Nacita, Wisconsin, um, and got on a couple climbs and established a couple projects for myself. Oh, what are these outdoor projects you're hoping to send this fall? Um, this fall, I'd like to try um, this 13 Whiskey A Go Go that I'm just drawn to. It's another kind of crimpy sequences, big long moves that I'm just like really attracted to in my climbing. And I really just want to work the sequences a lot this fall. Where is Whiskey A Go Go? It's in Nacita. Ah, beautiful. Yeah. Um, to save some time. For the questions at the end, we're going to pass it over to Indira to ask Trevor some questions. Thank you. Uh, Trevor, Trev. I can't believe it. We are here. Wow. Um, how are you feeling right now? I, I didn't know how I was going to feel. And man, I'm just so thankful. I'm seeing everyone talk in the chat. I'm really happy that everyone's able to come and see the film. So she just had moved to New York. I miss all my Chicago climbing friends and everyone here. I hope you guys all know my family is having a watch party and I could cry at any moment just thinking about it. So I feel great. Definitely. Um, you touched on this in an Instagram post, but why did you choose to film climbing and why now? Um, yeah, when I got into climbing in 2015, I think I'm just, I've just always been one of those learners that just like, as soon as I get into something, I have to go through YouTube University, I'm Googling, I'm reading books, I'm just doing everything, but especially I'm watching videos because you can just sit back and consume them. So from the very beginning, I was already taking photos for a long time. I just loved seeing all these incredible things that I was witnessing only through these videos that I never knew about. So from then on, it just seemed like something that I knew I wanted to be able to create, but I just didn't know how to take the step into it besides, you know, just the usual vloggy YouTube content. So mm -hmm. that was it. I just, I saw these amazing climbing films and I wanted to make one too. Yeah, dope. I know you, you anytime we were climbing, you were always bringing up videos and sending videos. So I, I know that's definitely your thing. So that's awesome. Uh, how did Taylor become the star of 
your work of this film? Yeah, Taylor and I started training together in I think 2019 or 2018. Um, but even before then, Ender, you were saying like, I already knew who she was in the gym. Like, I'm just, you know, seeing other climbers climb, we all know as climbers, watching other climbers in the act of climbing is such a cathartic and kind of like, uh, I don't know, like euphoric experience when they're a good climber, or especially when I should say they're a good climber, especially when they work really hard at what they do. So every day that I was in the gym, there were probably two days that Taylor was in the gym. I would always see her training. I would always see her doing her ab workout. And then I started hearing of her exploits doing like all the routes in the gym. So from the jump, like I was just already inspired by her. She was just like one of the climbers I looked up to at Brooklyn Motors in Chicago. Yeah, definitely. I, I always remember us being like, oh my gosh, she's so cool. Um, so it's, it's so amazing that, that we're here all these years later. So um, who would you say, you know, I know you were talking about all the videos that you're watching uh, that inspire. So who would you say are some of your play, favorite climbing personalities or mm -hmm. people in the climbing world that you're watching or that inspire mm -hmm. you? Yeah, I mean, I want to start off like this is kind of close to the chest, but um, he's really quiet. You wouldn't know the big impact that he has on especially like the community of climbers of color across the country. But Mikhail Martin. Um, you guys might have seen the film that Arcteryx released of him for their Outer Peace campaign today. Um, literally, like, Indra, you remember going to Color the Crag, what was it, 2018 was our first year, 2017? And just, like, looking up to climbers like Mikhail and just seeing them, like, live it out. Like, they were, like, they were saying less and doing more. So Mikhail was one of those. Um, I think a, an obvious shout-out um, is a climber, like a pioneer, like Emily, Emily Taylor. Um, I really look up to uh, YouTube creators like uh, Miguel Climbs, I see you in the chat, man. I really appreciate work like that. Um, I really, really, really like the work of Nathaniel Davidson, if you're talking about climbing films. Um, yeah, who else? Oh, on Instagram, I would say like uh, Malik the Martian, he's putting out crazy stuff. Uh, I would say uh, Tiff B. First, like she's been doing. I literally, they started an apprenticeship program for uh, root setters. And I remember the uh, yeah. mom was posting photos and I said on the, I commented, I was like, I want to see this film. And then I came to find out that Tiff was doing videos on YouTube. So if you look up Black Girls Boulder on YouTube, you can actually see her 99 Problem series or even some of the footage uh, from the root setting apprenticeship. So honestly, like my big thing is that like, I just, I was, was not seeing enough, uh, especially black climbers, but climbers of color period just creating content about climbing like I think we do need uh so much content about us being climbers of color but at the end of the day we all get a lot more stoked I think for climbing and so we need some of that too so those are some of the people who have been feeding that for me personally yeah definitely what um what are some of your favorite climbing films um man so the last real rock i was just i was just thinking about this before we got on but deep roots i know i just skipped mm -hmm. right over black ice right but like deep roots was a crazy film if we're talking like what makes an incredible climbing film that one was special like it was filmed over like 10 years it featured him like rebuilding a, a relationship with his father and then all the mm -hmm. while he's repeating his father's like 514 roots in yosemite valley mind-blowing mind-blowing um, other than that, like, uh, I think I want to give a big shout out to, I wonder if the, the, the filmmaking team behind these are still going, but if you look at Petzl rock trips on YouTube, um, those are absolutely crazy. There's like a whole, there's like, there's more than 10 of them. Um, and I won't, I don't know if it's a giveaway, but like they do all the music naturally from sounds that they make or get record while they're making the film. Um, and it's like hundreds of climbers from all across the country that are like kind of on this big climbing retreat. Um, so those uh, those two and those like those films, um, what would be another one? In terms of just straight like climbing psych, I gotta say, uh, if you go on Vimeo, you can research a film called Hard Grit Bouldering and you won't be disappointed. So those are just a few that come to mind. Yeah, definitely. Um, and before we get into the questions from the chat, um what is next what is next for you in film yes. and climbing Yo, there's a, 
There's a lot next. I mean, honestly, like what's funny about this film uh, with Taylor is that going into the new year, I believe I had just really picked up a camera for filmmaking and I wanted to get kind of a practice film together, like something that I could shoot in the gym with someone who I was already climbing with and Taylor and I were picking up training again. Um, so I think what's next is like taking on kind of a mix of like the longer projects, things that I've, I've been filming already that I'll share later, um, as well as like finding brands who want to work with a filmmaker that is going to show them and show and share stories about climbers in a way that I don't see them doing. You know, I just feel like I see the same story from brands of like, hey, we have a black person talking about being black and he's wearing our, you know, whatever the brand is, whatever the brand is. Right. So I just think I have a lot of that to offer to the outdoor world. Um, and I think I'm trying to prepare myself because I'm still so new to this. So, yeah, I think uh, the short of it is like looking for mentorship within filmmaking and within the outdoor space uh, with regards to that. And then, you know, meeting new climbers just moved to New York City. So if you're in New York City, let me know. We could climb meeting new climbers that I can be inspired by and we can make something. Yes. Definitely. And then you're, you're also going to come to LA, right? Um, <laughs> I am going to come to LA, yes. <laughs> um, Taylor and I are just chilling in Chicago alone. <laughs> well, you're all coming. You're all, all coming. going to LA. Okay, is what's <laughs> going to happen. But yeah, we're, we're super stoked to see what you have next. I know everyone, even before this, was really enjoying all of the videos you were posting on Instagram of just climbing at the gym just I love everything I know everyone was um, loving all that too so we can shift into questions from the chat uh Wanjiro if you want to take over questions for Taylor I do uh Taylor we have some good questions for you um the first one is what is your top climbing destination when you do have time to project something Probably right now, the Red uh, uh, Red River Gorge in Kentucky right now is like my favorite when I can get like a long weekend, like four days um, away from lab to just go do a good warm up day and then a try hard day um, for sure. Uh, lots of things out there that I am dying to get on. Um, the Red is beautiful and I'm whenever you do have that four day trip. As I said, I'm in Chicago, so hit me up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, how do you balance the rigors of your PhD program and training? I make a schedule, I think for myself, uh, is the best way I figured out um, after I started like really diving into a committed training routine was that it's in the morning, you know, I do kind of weighted activities. I go to the lab, I'm efficient in the lab. I decide, you know, on Sunday night, like what needs to happen, what day, what experiments need to happen when, if that experiment needs to be really done, when can I do that? Um, so it's not kind of this stress of like, oh, today has to go a certain way and then, you know, I'm flustered. Um, so I do make a really keen schedule that, that I try to stick to. And then, you know, in the evenings, I do whatever other exercises are kind of on my schedule or a climbing day, um, mostly in the evenings. And I just, like I said, it's just kind of become a habit and like a really um, drilled in self-discipline for myself, I think, that I try to stick to. Um, because I know if I get off, you know, I won't reach that end all goal. And that is really what kind of drives me long term. Um, the, and the next question you kind of touched on, but I think they're looking for a little bit more of a specific answer. But what keeps you motivated when you don't feel like training? I don't feel like training. Does she ever not feel like training? Did you ever I, not I feel was like going to ask that. I was <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like, 5 a.m. Um, <laughs> When I don't feel like training, I think, again, it's just kind of like a habit. Like uh, my body's awake at five. I've gotten up at five so many days in a row now that like I'm awake. I might as well do something. If I don't feel like doing what I had planned to do, like let's say it was a whole heavy added weight pull, 
um, exercise that morning, I'm not feeling it. I'm going to listen to my body and say, you know, we're just going to do some core and some mobility work. I can do that another day. Um, so I think what also helps me, because I used to start with my training of like, oh, on Monday, it's this Wednesday, it's this Tuesday, it's this kind of thing. And it kind of became more of listening to my body and saying, I just need to hit two pool days this week, whatever days I feel like when I get up, I can do it, then I'm going to do that. Um, I'm going to hit one lower body day, I'm going to hit one, you know, um, endurance day at the gym, something like that. But it's less of me trying to stick to a day a week that it has to happen and more of just me saying, you know, today's just doesn't feel like a weighted day, I need to just kind of, you know, stretch and do some mobility. That's a beautiful lesson. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, I was a swimmer as well. I never told you that, but I was. And mm. I like this question a lot. What is your favorite swim cap? It is so hard to find good ones when you have a lot of hair. I mean, I don't, but. <laughs> um, it was a trial and error. I'll definitely say that uh, as a kid, I was wearing like two, three swim caps because I used to try to keep it dry. And that's just the more hair you have, you get like little pockets by your ear that you're just going to get yeah. water pressure. Um, I definitely always stuck to latex, those thinner ones. And then I always got a cotton cap underneath. Otherwise, the latex would like slide off um, because the more hair you have, the less aerodynamic your head is in the water. And so like it would always fall off and I'd be between laps like fixing it and my coach would always get mad. So. <laughs> <laughs> Learn to double cap and use latex. Okay. Good to know. Uh, and back to a climbing related question. What is your favorite style of climbing? Overhang. Overhang every, every day. I do not like slab. Slab is my biggest fear. I know I need to work on it. I had this fear that I'm just going to slide down and the money maker in my face or something. It's just going to get <laughs> fly stuff and I'm going to be ruined or something. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, overhang all day. I think that's also why I train core so much because I like to visualize if I'm doing like a hollow body for several minutes, I'm constantly visualizing like, say there's this route at the red called Twinkie and like half of it is 45 angle, just jug haul, but you have to keep your core super tight. And I think that's why I train it so much because I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> let's just visualize ourselves on this overhang route all day. Do you prefer bouldering or roping? roping that's the only way I think Trevor and I started climbing because I got him into lead uh, <laughs> straight off now I do like some bouldering now once a week with friends because okay. there is some benefits to it I'm learning <laughs> yes um the <laughs> next question is uh what's your favorite challenge that climbing brings favorite challenge I would say for me, initially, I was really afraid of heights. Um, and I think when I got past that uh, barrier for myself, now it kind of is uh, the mental and physical like intersection of like doing a really hard sequence um, at a height that I'm uncomfortable with, but I have to kind of like check that mental connection with my body and kind of just bring myself into the moment and you know face the physical challenge that i'm having which is doing a sequence that uh, you know i'm still working on and kind of putting the the fear of the height kind of out of my head at the moment because um and i think when that happens when it w does work out and i'm above a cliff but i get that sequence locked in then i'm like oh yeah we got to get back on like a route like that because that was amazing like that's what you know definitely drives me when i come back down off the wall to do it again Beautiful. Um, last question, and before we go to Trevor, what parallels do you see between your climbing and your science? And science, not your science. I definitely see self-discipline as something um, that I use every day in the lab, as well as um, kind of just that excitement to do something, like when an experiment works, when like a staining works um, for those who are in neuroscience when I'm having to stain my tissue um, or when a recording works, especially uh, with 
cell patch clamp um, electrophysiology for those, again, in neuroscience. Um, when I get on a cell and it's firing and I can start manipulating its activity to kind of, you know, ask it questions, um, that I, I would say parallels to when I get on a challenging route that's doing sequences that like initially I'm just like, wow, this is really hard for me. But when it clicks, when my body can like flow through that sequence a little bit easier than it did before, I'm like, wow, this is like why I'm doing this. This is really exciting and like gets me hyped up to do it again. So when an experiment works, I'm always like, yeah, like that's amazing. Let's ask more questions. Let's you know, dive into this deeper. And then uh, again, I'm in the lab until like, you know, late, because I'm just like, yeah, that was really cool. Let's see what, what else we can analyze or what else we can get out of it. Uh, thank you. We will have a couple of questions for both of you at the end. But for now, I'll pass it back to Indra for Trevor's question. Thank you. Uh, Trevor, so what were some of the things that you learned during the process of making the film? Um, whoa, holy crap. Shout out to everybody who's ever made a film. First of all, it's like 200 things to do at one time just to get the, what you're trying to capture. So I think just juggling, like really learning to juggle, um, my goal really then and right now is to learn how to tell stories better. Um, but it's just mind boggling to me, you know, when you're filming, you have to be thinking about the composition in the frame. You have to be thinking about whether just the light, the exposure is right. You have to be thinking about um, how this scene is going to work into the next one. Um, and then all, after all that said and done, you've forgotten to record any good audio and you're kind of screwed in that department. So I think the, the one thing I learned is that you really need to have a clear picture of what you're going to do. Um, kind of like Taylor's talking about with her research, is like you really have to like plan it out. So I got a lot better at that. But man, there was, I remember the first um, time I first, after the first day we filmed, kind of like the intro, I got home and I had like an hour of footage. And I was like, what? Like, why is there an hour of footage? I'm going to, I'm going to use 15 seconds of this. So yeah, just uh, time management, um, really focusing and doing checklists and remember what you need to do. Um, but then, you know, on the other side of it, when you have done all that, that it's not as hard it's not impossible, I should say. It's not impossible, which it seems yeah. like it is when you watch these incredible films. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I mean, I've always thought of you as a great storyteller with your work, you know, your community organizing work. I think you've always been able to like tell stories really well. So it's dope to see you kind of taking that and shifting that over into telling stories, but through film. So obviously there's a lot more to it, but um, yeah, this, this is really great. Uh, what was your hardest challenge during the making of the film? Um, I think like the transition between like filming everything and having the idea and having, especially after we finished all the filming days, we filmed over like two months, like when on weekends when we could. Um, and once I had all the footage, it's really like the beautiful stories don't just pop out of nowhere in the edit like it doesn't just like reveal itself um all the audio that you heard was from like an hour and a half long interview so you can imagine just how much was said that i decided didn't fit or taylor suggested it'd be better if we this enough taylor remember that that time that you suggested that we re-record an entire section of the interview <laughs> So, yeah, I think the hardest part really was um, kind of feeling that tension of like really wanting to create something that Taylor feels comfortable with um, and also something that I'm proud of um, all while just kind of, I wouldn't call it flying blind. Like I said, I do a lot of research and I've, I've studied a lot, but on your first one, it kind of feels like, I don't know, like when you put a big lump of clay on the table and you're like, how is this going to turn into a statue, you know? So that was hard, like managing all of the footage uh, and the interview audio and trying to make that fit in something cohesive. Yeah, definitely. And the people want to know, are you still climbing, bro? Yo, are bro. You, Trevor. <laughs> Yo, climbing? the climb back is serious. Last year <laughs> around March, <laughs> I started working from home. I did not realize 
how powerful the effects of a sedentary lifestyle were on the human body. It turns out your boy's a little chunky now. Not chunky, I'm not gonna say that, but like you guys know when like you start working out again, and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna get fit. And then like, it's just hard. It just feels like your body is not catching up to the pace at which you're working out. So yes, I am, for anybody in New York City, I am predominantly climbing at uh, cliffs at Harlem. Um, and then when I go outside, there's uh, some boulders on 163rd and Edgecombe. And I've also been going up to East River Park in Harlem around 200th Street. So um, yeah, I'm ready, I'm ready. In fact, I just um, kind of lined up a membership. I think I kind of found a home gym at uh, Cliffs of Harlem. So you can find me there. I will be doing pull-ups five at a time. I will be dripping, it will be sweaty. It's hot this summer, it's muggy. Yes, I'm ready, I'm ready. <laughs> yes, <laughs> glad to hear. I think we're all just trying to find ways to move and giving ourselves grace after, you know, and, and it's still a, a rough time for a lot of people. So glad to hear still climbing, we gotta climb. Um, for both of you, what do you look for in a route when either climbing it or filming it? So climbing it, I'm going to throw that to Taylor. What do I look for in a route? I look for a no slap. Um, <laughs> um, I look for sequences. Uh, if I'm honest, I look for something that's challenging for me uh, or pulls out, you know, me working on a weakness. I'm not the best at um, slopers. So I do like if I'm looking at a route and I do know, or if, you know, slow up, you know, slopers can kind of outdoors uh, be hidden, but in the gym, if I see a big sloper section, I'm definitely game to get on it and work it. Um, but I do like to see a big move sequence on cramps that excites me. I'm like, ooh, I really want to get on it um, and, you know, fall a bunch of times, especially. But uh, I like I like a big sequence on um, cramps for sure, especially if it's reachy and I have to, like, pull, you know, a lot of leg sequences into uh, or leg energy into getting that move mm -hmm. or sticking it. It's uh, really mm -hmm. exciting. For sure. If you, I'll have you climb slab and then you help me do the overhang. Too. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Trevor, what do you look for in a route when you are filming it? Like, how did you go about like oh, choosing? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting because I think I, I spent a lot of time, like even now, like I've been recording just off and on, like kind of like phone footage of climbs and stuff, just like everybody, right? Like we try to record a cool climb that we like, and then we just like sit there and stare at our butt for the next minute and a half. And we're like, why didn't this look cool? <laughs> so the way I try to escape that is I look for climbs that uh, you have to like open your body up to one side, as opposed to just kind of being crunched in those small kind of boxes that you get on, on really um, kind of overly technical climbs. Um, so, um, I think I kind of look for stuff that I like style wise, which is really long reaches. Um, and then there's like, yeah, there's sometimes like you can just see a shape to a climb, whether I think is why I'm, I'm attracted to a ret climbs, uh, on corners is because you can just see like a natural shape to it. That is usually just, it feels like aesthetic. It feels like there's something, uh, uh, nice, visually pleasing to it. So I look for stuff like that. And yeah, like I said, stuff that opens your body up to one side because as whether you're taking photos or taking video again like it just sucks when all you can see is like their back and their armpit and their butt like their left calf <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah when you're you can go ahead <laughs> uh for both of you again what do you guys prefer long approaches or climbing out in the parking lot climbing out the parking lot I'm assuming that's like. Taylor likes four. climbing on thread, so. I like a good long approach. Then I'm warmed up, and then I like don't have to do, per se. If I'm projecting that day, I don't have to do too much of a warm up. Um, definitely. Uh, recently, I went to the red, and a friend and I went to the chocolate factory, and we started 
way too far away from the route we were getting to. So we basically walked the entire crag. And then we're like, oh, there's an easier way to get here. <laughs> um, walked an hour, and then we're like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I like a good long approach, sets up the day. Trevor, how do you feel about approaches? I think I'm a luxury climber, honestly. I, I want to say like I, so I came into climbing from like backcountry camping and hiking, like 13 mm -hmm. hours out in the backcountry to get up to elevation and then to camp out, some hot springs or something. And I think what I loved about climbing is that you could get that feeling of being out there while also only having walked like 15 minutes. So yeah, I think I'm a short, I think I'm a short guy. In fact, like I, I recently like went up to a park just like, just like 20 blocks north of here, but it took a half hour to walk <laughs> on city blocks. <laughs> and I found myself, like I arrived there and I was like, yeah, boulders are cool, but are they this cool though? <laughs> <laughs> short for me. <laughs> Favorite um, crag food? Trevor? I always have a banana, but like what snacks is, and I have to shout out to my partner, Catherine, dried mango. Is it dried mango? Yeah. Dried mango. Yeah. yeah. That was my answer. Dried mangoes. Always from Trader Joe's, $1.99 a pack. Get five of them for the weekend. Eat a whole pack of them. All right, this is going to piss my jar off too, but I love me some sunflower seeds. I'm not going to lie. It's going to be good. We don't got to get into it right now, but put in the chat if you think that the shells are biodegradable or not. <laughs> <laughs> leave no trace. It is simple. Leave no trace. If you leave the sunflower seeds, Trevor, you just trace. Trace. not opening the door. We're going to close that again. You guys are lovely. Um, we have one last question for you both. Um, any idea why climbing seems to fully engage the brain? Taylor, we'll let you go first. Um, I'd say because you're engaging your full peripheral nervous system, which is your arms and your legs, um, as well as the mental and, um, aspect of working through, you know, that mental game, that fear some of us have, or just constantly processing what is my next move, um, while also trying to control every aspect of your limbs, your, you know, your focus on even you know, your big toe engagement, you know, as little as that to, you know, getting a high foot or a heel hook um, to kind of what, you know, half of your pad is doing on the rock, right? Um, while also thinking and planning out your next move, or if you are like me and you're like, oh man, I shouldn't have done that sequence. It just made that clip really hard. Um, and you're thinking about past events <laughs> while you're also planning your next sequence. Um, it's fully engaging which I think is why a lot of people um, are really drawn to it because it takes you out of the rest of your, you know, the world and really pulls you into the present moment of what your body's doing and um, mm -hmm. is really addicting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Uh, Trevor? So why is climbing so engaging? Fully engaging of the Fully. brain. Yeah, I mean, I think like, I think Taylor's right, like how much you have to focus um when I was coaching more I'd always like tell climbers to like put their brain in their foot or their hand or whatever like limb was falling off or failing the movement um and I think that kind of way of um another way of looking at it is like you're you're all you can see is like the two feet in front of you I think like that part and then like you said you add the when you add fear into it um man like because there's so much on the line like actually on the line and like how often in our you know i'm really i'm like a really fortunate lucky person who has just not encountered many like near-death experiences or anything but climbing is like consistently putting you in like a mind state that um gives you that adrenaline rush that you would get from like a fight or flight life or death situation um, while also being in like a super, um, usually, typically, um, if you're around good people, you can trust safe environment, you know? So yeah, I'd say it's that, just the fact that if you don't fully engage, your climbing's gonna suffer for it, you know? And you see this all the time in the gym when you see climbers just kind of like lurching at one limit at a time. Um, 
and this is the difference when you see climbers climbing really smooth and controlled is that they're just completely tracking all the things that's going on and have taught their muscles um, to track it for them when they're not thinking over practice. Well, thank you both. That's all the questions. And uh, I'm gonna hand it off to Trevor for- I will, I will say there was one more that I'll hand it off to Trevor by asking you this question and then we can close this, close this off. Uh, the question was, if we missed part at the beginning, is there another way to watch the full film later on? Oh, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, I did a lot of thinking about this. I figured I would just release it tomorrow on YouTube. So for anybody, like my baby sister, I think I saw in the family chat that she was not able to access it right away. Um, Lexi, you can go tomorrow on YouTube at, I think I'm going to do like 10 a.m. Um, Eastern time, so 9 a.m. Central. I'll put it on YouTube and I'll also post it on Instagram for anybody that is mobile. Dope. Any final words, Trev? Um, yeah, I think uh, a big thing that I like really cared about when I started this and still do, but is that it's, it's not, there's not a lot of like, in fact, I don't know if there is much at all. Paul Robinson has a video. There's not a lot of people teaching or like sharing a lot of insight into how these climbing films get made um and i don't know why that is but i just want to encourage anyone who's watching um i i think i saw some climbers in here who have asked me some questions before but um whatever is holding you back from creating whatever you want to make whether it's just better climbing reels on instagram or better climbing compilations from your trips like just start recording um, and then get used to uploading it to your computer and watching some YouTube videos about it because um, really it's, it's sort of similar to climbing that once you start feeling um, that reward of creating something that you're proud of, it, it'll just feed itself. So yeah, I just wanna encourage everyone to make more content. Like as someone who is starting to make it myself, um, I'm still maybe now consuming even more. So um, if you guys make, some climbing films or climbing videos um, or Harrison, if you're in here, I saw your recent uh, send of that dyno at Broken Boulders Lincoln Park where you did multiple angles. That shit was kind of hot, man. I like that. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. So I think that's just what I would leave everybody with. Um, you're, you know you're inspired by the climbers around you. You know that when you catch yourself on camera, you find yourself being inspired by your damn self. So capture it, um, share it because I think that's what a lot of, that's what I see missing when I get on YouTube and I wanna watch people. Um, I don't see like climbers like myself or the climbers in my circle. It's, you know, all these dudes and puppies who live on the road 24 seven. So yeah, go make it and keep watching uh, and share it tomorrow when we share it. I really appreciate that. Um, and like we said at the beginning, uh, if you do wanna support me making more films, um, and all of us for our work tonight, putting this together and Taylor for her time uh, as a talent and subject of film. And you can donate um, to my cash app. I'll distribute it with everyone. That's, I think, dollar sign Riley TK. So other than that, thank you. And thank you everyone for watching.
Thank you.